Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Digital Innovation and Financial Safety Net keynote session this afternoon. I'd like to begin by thanking Payments Canada for inviting us to speak to you today about the challenges and opportunities that are on the horizon as our federal financial agencies face innovation and often disruptive events within our sector. My name is Mike Mercer. I'm the Chief Data and Insurance Officer at the Canada Deposit Insurance Corporation and very pleased to be the moderator for this afternoon's event. Uh, in keeping with the Indigenous protocol and building respectful relationships between the Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples of Canada, I'd like to acknowledge that CDIC's corporate headquarters is on the unceded Algonquin Anishinaabek territory, uh, but appreciating we're all meeting virtually today, so I'd like to further acknowledge that the Indigenous peoples are the traditional stewards of the lands and waters where each of us live and work. But let me begin the session this afternoon with a real understatement. It's fair to say that we have witnessed a rapid acceleration in the digitalization of financial services over the past two years. And as Canada's financial safety net, we clearly recognize that the digital economy presents a bountiful opportunity to grow the prosperity of Canadians and also risks to the safety and soundness and the stability, which is the cornerstone of our economy. Canadians' confidence in the financial system is paramount to our collective efforts and the digitization of money, assets, and financial services is really challenging the regulatory constructs that have been established in Canada and around the world. Earlier this month, I'm sure you've all seen that the government delivered the 2022 federal budget, which outlines important measures that will maintain the integrity of the financial system, promote fair competition, and enhance consumer confidence. In particular, the government announced the launch of financial sector legislative review, focused on the digitization of money and maintaining financial sector stability and security. And we'll get to all of those topics and more as part of the discussion this afternoon. So we've split it into two sections. First, we'll hear an overview from each of our panelists. And then it's over to you, the questions that you have for our panelists. Uh, and we'll make sure we uh, get to as many as we can this afternoon. And those we don't get to, we'll work with our friends at Payments Canada uh, to get those answered. Uh, so with all that as our backdrops, I'll be pleased to introduce our four speakers today. Ron Morrow is the Executive Director in Retail Payment Supervision at the Bank of Canada. Ron took up this position in August 2021, reporting directly to the Governor. Ron leads the design and implementation of the Retail Payment Supervisory Framework and is leading the ongoing consultations with many of you on how that supervisory framework will take place. Uh, also, we have Peter Rutledge, who is the Superintendent of Financial Institutions at OSFI. Peter was appointed Superintendent in June of 2021 for a seven-year term and recently launched a new blueprint for how OSFI is transforming and how the Prudential Supervisor is boldly addressing the current risk environment. And Peter will share his views uh, on that today. Uh, Leah Anderson is the President and CEO of the Canada Deposit Insurance Corporation. Leah was appointed uh, to that role in August of 2021 as leading the expansion and modernization of the deposit insurance and resolution framework for deposit taking banks and trust companies. And Judith Robertson is our commissioner of the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada. She was appointed commissioner in August of 2019 and is leading the FCAC's mandate to supervise federally regulated financial entities and strengthen financial literacy in Canadians, important to us all. Uh, but let's begin with Ron. Um, Ron, under your direction, and the Bank of Canada is developing a framework for retail payments and supervision, um, which really focuses and aims on the confidence and the stability and reliability of payment services while protecting end users from specific risks. Uh, I know this has been underway for some time and you've had the opportunity to meet for, with many of the audience, uh, but let's give a sense of where we're at today and where you see the future unfolding. Thanks very much, uh, Mike. So maybe I'll, I'll start first with a, a bit of the motivation behind uh, our, our new role in, in terms of retail payment supervision. And, and that's the fact that uh, every day, millions of Canadians uh, place their trust in payment service providers whenever they tap their card or make an online purchase. And the goal of this new mandate is to give Canadians confidence that the trust they've placed in payment service providers is warranted, that their funds will be protected, and that risks will be well managed. So how is all this going to work in practice? Well, first things first, payment service providers are gonna be required to register with the bank. So, and who, who's in that bucket of people who will need to register with us? Uh, so uh, if you perform one of uh, five payment functions, uh, there's, there's information on our website about that. I'll, I'll 
provide some info on that a little uh, a little later. Uh, the and you're not already prudentially regulated. You're you're captured by the regime. So that covers everyone from large multi-billion-dollar international payment companies to two-person fintech startups that are focused on payments. Uh, our best estimate is that there are about 2,000 payment service providers uh, in Canada who will need to register with us. Registration is going to be largely a come as you are. There's there's no fit fit and proper or or risk based assessment at the time of registration. All you have to do is be you know perform one of the five payment functions and provide us with some uh, some information. Once you've done that, uh, we're going to do two things. Uh, we're going to be uh, assessing uh, how you're doing it, uh, how payment service providers are doing it, managing operational risks. So think business continuity, cyber risks, protecting end users' personal and financial information. Uh, we're gonna have a principles-based approach to all of this. And what this means is that entities will be able to design their risk management practices to suit their business and the risks they face. This is particularly important as PSPs vary very significantly in terms of size and scope of their operations, uh, as well as the risks uh, they face. Sometimes they face similar risks, but on very different scales. Second key requirement is around uh, safeguarding end user funds. So if you are holding, if a payment service provider is holding end users funds, uh, they're gonna have to protect those from the, the payment service providers insolvency. There are a few options uh, to do this, such as segregating funds and holding them in trust on behalf of uh, end users or purchasing third party insurance. Uh, so where are we at with all of this? So our current focus uh, right now is supporting the Department of Finance as uh, regulations for the regime get developed. Uh, so stay tuned for public consultation from the Department of Finance on those regulations uh, coming this fall. We're building out our supervisory infrastructure. We're hiring people, building systems. Uh, we're about 25 uh, people right now in retail payment supervision on our way to 120 or so. Uh, we've uh, engaged uh, Carol Brigham, who some of you, many of you, I think may know uh, to uh, head up our retail payment supervision department. And we're focused on building uh, awareness so that the 2000 odd uh, PSPs out there uh, know this regime is coming and know what their responsibilities are. So, uh, but none of this is static. The, you know, the, the landscape is, is changing around us. One of the questions I often get is around uh, the use of this regime when it, uh, and how it applies to things like stable coins or, uh, or crypto. Now, the, as it stands right now, the, the regime is set up to deal only with payments in fiat currencies. So Canadian dollars, US dollars, sterling, uh, currencies issued by a, by a country. Uh, but it can be expanded to to include things like stable coins or or crypto. The and indeed the, the Bank of Canada is currently working with our, our federal fellow regulators and provincial regulators, really to think about how best uh, authorities should respond to uh, crypto and stable coins in an integrated and coordinated way. So no decisions yet, but uh, some good active uh, discussions around how best to do this in the interest of Canadians. Uh, I would also note the, the recent budget announcement where the government promised to launch a legislative review of the digitalization of money, including cryptocurrencies and stable coins and, and how they impact the financial sector. Uh, uh, so that's it, you know, in terms of how people can stay in touch, uh, the, there's a ton of information on our website, bankofcanada.ca slash RPS has a host of uh, additional material. You can also sign up for our newsletter to keep in touch on as we progress to uh, to bring the bring this new regime to life. So there you go. Thanks very much, Ron. No, it's certainly fascinating to see it take shape, and uh, I know many interested onlookers in terms of uh, what those new regulations will mean for them and how they comply with all the various facets you've outlined. And absolutely, please go to the website and subscribe to the newsletter to keep up to date on uh, on the latest developments there. Um, uh, Peter, just over to you. Um, I, I know from reading your uh, annual risk uh, announcement that you've made this week, um, digital and innovation is front of mind for the supervisor. So please give us a, a sense of the outlook that OSFI and yourself yeah. um, has as we look at the risk environment ahead of us. Thanks, Mike. And it's, it's great to be here virtually with everyone today. I hope 
Next year, it'll be uh, in, in person, but uh, such as it is. Um, so you mentioned our, our risk environment, Mike, and I'll, I'll touch on our risk outlook in just a moment, but uh, you'd also mentioned our, transformative, our transformation effort uh, that we began uh, really formally uh, on April 1 of this year. Um, and a key tenet of that transformation is uh, to turn to the horizon and face it and identify the risks that we see and adapt to them with agility. And you know, I've spent a lot of time uh, in my career looking at risks in a variety of different assignments that I had. Uh, and what our gaze uh, onto the horizon tells us now is that our risk environment is very volatile or is populated with risks that are quite volatile complex, interrelated, and ultimately existential. Um, and what has been successful in the past may not be sufficient uh, to address those risks that we face today. Uh, and so one way of dealing with that is, is to be completely transparent about what we face and what we're worried about and how we're adapting. Uh, it's a useful, I think, contribution uh, to the Canadian public debate. Uh, and I think it also keeps us honest. Uh, so we published, we, you referred to our annual risk outlook. Uh, and this is a document, fairly short, and it's available on our website. And it outlines the key risks we see and what our intended regulatory and supervisory responses will be to those risks. Um, and you mentioned that there's a number of them, climate change, housing market, cyber attacks, but the one we'll talk about today is the digitalization of finance. Uh, and digitalization uh, of finance has been underway for decades. Uh, I mean, one could argue the ATM was a form of digitalization. Um, and each time technology has arrived onto the market, the financial system has adapted to it and brought it in. And generally speaking, digitalization brings convenience and opportunity and value for customers and small businesses and medium-sized businesses and large businesses. Uh, and our view at OSFI is uh, we need to create a safe system where continued digitalization produces more value and more competition uh, in our sector. Um, so we've seen development and growth in, in aggregation applications and credit applications uh, and more Canadians uh, than ever are turning to digital, digital banking. I don't know if my son's ever been to a branch um, and I don't know if any of his friends have. Uh, and that's a good thing. Um, and there are welcome de developments, but we need to keep a clean eye on, on, the, uh, uh, on the risk environment and uh, focus on issues like consumer protection, like tracking illicit activities and like uh, in OSFI's case, most importantly, financial stability. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that digitalization today, as it uh, takes its form in digital money, in aggregation applications, in new forms of credit origination, is innovating faster than the framework legislation in Canada that oversees the stability of the financial system here in our country. And so all of us here on this panel and in the federal financial safety net have to accelerate our efforts. And I can assure you, we are in the process of accelerating our efforts to deal with these issues. Uh, I, I'm, as uh, Mike mentioned earlier, you will have seen some of the work being planned for the federal oversight framework in the financial budget, which uh, was tabled a few weeks ago. Modernizing payments, consumer protection, deposit insurance, and open banking are all on the agenda. Uh, it's clear to me that the financial system is not an island unto itself and material risks outside the traditional players are part uh, of our real and future economy. Uh, where Canadians rely on and expect financial services to be efficient, safe, and credible, uh, expanding the current regulatory perimeter is a simple choice. We cannot stay where we are now and expect continued resilience while unregulated players grow outside of protections that Canadians have long benefited from and that Canadians today expect and merit. And so with that, Mike, I'll turn it back to you and look forward to hearing 
uh, from Leah and Judith and taking some questions. Thanks very much, Peter. And certainly one of the protections that you mentioned there that uh, all Canadian savers benefit from is deposit insurance. So uh, Leo, over to you. And, and this is, a, we're coming up in a very special time for CDIC because we're, as of April 30th, our deposit insurance expands um, um, for all, uh, all Canadians. Um, uh, so, you know, while we might think those are important protections today, as the digital economy grows, the question may be where to next? Where is CDIC casting its gaze in terms of enhanced protection uh, as we move forward? Right. Thank you, Mike. And it's uh, just great to be here with my colleagues and just great to be here uh, as part of this forum. Uh, it's unfortunate that I'm not able to be there uh, with all of you. Uh, payments is very close to my heart. I worked with many of you in the development of the Retail Payments Act while um, in my former role at the Department of Finance. And a number of you were on a consultative committee, which I chaired uh, at Finance called FinPay to uh, help uh, the government in terms of evolving the, uh, the payments regulatory framework. It's, uh, and it's also really great to, to be able to talk about a very topical issue, obviously innovation and uh, bringing together our, our agency friends here to talk about it from our respective priorities. You know, as you've heard from Ron and Peter, our priorities are very linked and, and they're reinforcing. And as a result, we work very closely together to ensure that the framework really does support the opportunity of innovation, but at the same time, help us prudently manage the risks, both for end users into the financial system as a whole. Collectively, our overarching public purpose objectives for the sector, which includes the payment system ecosystem, are really fourfold. One, safety and soundness. Second, security. Third, innovation and competition. And third, consumer protection, which really does include um, the utility of the system to consumers and, and, and users. So Ron earlier shared the important motivation for the retail payments framework, which is to ensure consumer trust and confidence in their ability to reliably transact in the economy. CDIC has a related but distinct role as deposit insurer. That is to ensure consumer trust and confidence in the safety of their savings held in CDIC member institutions. And what does this do? Well, this ensures consumers' ability to save and also to transact. We provide peace of mind that the money you work for, hard for, is safe. It will be there when you need it to make a payment, as well as for any major expense like living costs, mortgage down payment, transportation, tuition, et cetera. And deposit insurance also supports financial stability. So when consumers, it allows that consumers have confidence that their money is safe no matter what and that they do not need to worry about it. So for savings products at CDIC member institutions, there's no need to panic or run uh, under any circumstances to keep your hard earned savings safe. Turning to our, our priorities, I'll share three in the innovation space. First is helping consumers understand their deposit insurance coverage. So consumers benefit, as we've talked about, from a range of products and services from different providers in the financial system. But these products and services may present very different consumer protection risks. Some may increasingly look and feel a bit like bank deposits, but they're not. So what do we do? We focus on public awareness through advertising and a range of media and have an established web presence to build knowledge and understanding. And we also partner with our friends at the FCAC to increase financial literacy. And we work with our member institutions to provide consumers information about the value of the production provided by deposit insurance. And I'd also note that we have rules that prohibit false or misleading information about CDIC protection, which also helps support uh, consumer awareness and clarity. The second priority, uh, really topical for this uh, summit, is anticipating and, responsing, uh, anticipating and responding to future innovation. So like uh, Ron and Peter have talked about, uh, we too continue to be very forward-looking and proactive. And for us, that's really, really in relation to our coverage protection and the awareness given the proliferation of products, service providers, and distribution channels. 
And as I mentioned at the outset, we really are working hand in glove with our regulatory partners to ensure the framework is an enabler of innovation, but at the same time, protecting consumers and financial stability. The third priority is transforming our own processes. As Payments Canada advances on its payment modernization journey, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about at this summit uh, over the, these few days, we too are transforming our processes at CDIC by innovating and leveraging technology. We have launched a payout modernization project, and this enables even faster payout to Canadians of their savings held at a CDIC member institution in the event of a failure and in ways that meet the evolving expectations of Canadians in a digital economy. I'll turn it back over to you, Mike. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Leah. Um, I think we've you know, heard throughout the summit today and, uh, and certainly from other panelists' remarks, we're all consuming financial products differently um, and in, in ways we maybe didn't imagine before or uh, that'll evolve in the future. And it really puts uh, consumer protection um, on our minds and literacy. So Judith, how is the FCAC uh, thinking through these challenges in a digital economy? Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, I'll, I'll echo the comments of my colleagues saying how pleased I am to be here uh, yeah, to share our perspectives on digital innovation and the federal financial safety net. And to be sure, this is a pivotal time for financial institutions and providers and regulators alike. Uh, our role is to protect consumers of financial products and services. And we do that by overseeing compliance of the federally regulated financial institutions with the consumer protection and market conduct requirements. And these typically fall into three main buckets, effective disclosure, meaningful consent, and fair and efficient uh, problem resolution. We also conduct research and lead a national network of stakeholders to strengthen the financial literacy of Canadians. And last summer, we published a new financial literacy strategy, which is really groundbreaking. And so taken together, our role is designed uh, uh, to address the fundamental knowledge and power differences between individuals and large or small but sophisticated uh, financial institutions. And this is of course based on the premise that our financial system works best if consumers have the knowledge they need to make good choices and that they are provided with real choice that addresses their financial needs without manipulation or coercion. And finally, they need to have the confidence that when problems arise, they will be resolved quickly and fairly. And you'll note that all of the speakers on this panel have emphasized the importance of promoting and enhancing confidence in the financial system. And I think this is even more important in a period of change like we're going through now. Leah's example is really worth uh, emphasizing uh, the importance of clarity around uh, what consumers know and what they don't know. If consumers have a good knowledge of what is and what is not covered by deposit insurance, they can have confidence about what to expect during periods of crises or unusual events and will be less prone to reacting uh, inappropriately. In our work, we've identified two key macro drivers of change that we're using that are helping us to evolve and adapt to this new environment. The first one is a global shift about consumer protection regulation, which is a shift away from prescriptive rules to one based on looking at the consumer outcomes that uh, we are trying to achieve through regulation. A good example of this development is found in Canada's new financial consumer protection framework in the Bank Act. It includes many new and enhanced protections that will come into force the end of June this year and will align us with best practices in other jurisdictions. Taken together, these new protections will help us move away from a buyer beware environment to one that's based on a shared responsibility between the consumer and the provider of bank services. As an example, banks will have a new obligation to offer products that are appropriate for their customers and that reflect their financial needs and circumstances. 
banks will also have to ensure that the financial incentives of their employees do not interfere with this obligation to offer or sell appropriate products. So in short, it's, it will be the responsibility of the provider to validate that their products and sales process considers the needs and abilities of consumers, including those in vulnerable circumstances. The second long-term uh, macro driver that is shaping uh, consumer, the way we look at consumer protection is the need to ensure that consumers benefit from consistent standards as products and markets evolve. Consumers do not currently have, and nor should they be expected to acquire the knowledge about different regulatory environments as part of their product choices. For consumers to have confidence in the financial system, they should be able to have a reasonable expectation that the base level requirements of disclosure, consent, and problem resolution will be respected. Whether the product is provided by a bank or an affiliate of a bank, a new entrance or a third party distribution partner. A consistent standard also provides an advantage to industry as it should be able to rely on a level playing field with no regulatory overlap or opportunities for, arbitra uh, for regulatory arbitrage. And here I'll note that when we say consistent standard that does not mean identical and this is where the interplay between these two key drivers is very helpful for us adapting to what comes next. Um, if it's consistent, we can, be, we can consider uh, proportionate and adaptive regulation, focusing on the outcomes we're looking for, as opposed to just transporting uh, an existing regime to a new context. These changes are daunting to operationalize for both industry and regulators alike, but taken together, they do offer an exciting opportunity to support innovation and competition without sacrificing consumer protection. So I'll leave my remarks there and uh, look forward to the conversation through the questions. Thanks very much, Judith. We certainly are getting questions in and there's a reminder that uh, please use the functionality uh, on Zoom to fire your question in and we'll direct it uh, to the panel. Um, uh, I do have one here, I think a really interesting one. Um, uh, and I'll direct it to, to you first, uh, Ron, and, and perhaps also uh, Peter. Um, but uh, the audience member suggesting that a lot of discussion on the risks of financial innovation, and certainly that was highlighted in the emergency measures and budget announcements from the government. Um, but is there room right now in the narrative that expanded membership and access to Payment Canada systems will spur innovation safely in a regulated sector instead of outside it. Now, certainly the retail payments framework um, aims to that somewhat, um, but what's your thoughts there, Ron? Well, I, I think the, there are a wealth of great opportunities uh, from, uh, from innovation for the, for the financial system and the you know our goal is to just to make sure that Canadians can benefit from those innovations in a uh, in a, in a safe way so you know for example the you know the uh, development of the retail payment supervision areas plan changes to the uh, uh, payments Canada act by the Department of Finance the rollout of the new real-time rail should all of that should uh, uh, allow give uh, new innovative players, greater access to uh, Canada's uh, uh, payment and clearing infrastructure, and uh, allow them to uh, to bring the benefits of the, you know their new technology, their new features to directly to uh, to Canadians. The if there's a uh, something I hear on a regular basis is why you know why is it taking so long? Why can't why can't it happen more quickly? I, the I have a lot of sympathy for that. It, the we are. I know everyone involved is working to get this up and running as quickly as we can so that uh, Canadians can benefit from uh, uh, from these new innovative uh, companies and the services they offer. And Peter, I wanna expand that a little bit because you mentioned being outside the perimeter. Is OSFI thinking differently about how um, it provides licenses to financial institutions and the entry regime? Yeah, I, I don't think digitalization gives us a choice I think we have to. We have to think creatively about 
what new technologies might bring to the market, uh, what value they might bring, uh, and adapt our policies so that the value gets into our, our market, the market we regulate safely, um, so that Canadians get the benefits and have rel and minimize uh, the, the cost of instability. Uh, the advantage we have right now in the regulated system is it's backed by everything. It's backed by a prudential regulator, a strong central bank. It also takes care of our retail payment system, an outstanding deposit insurer, and an invaluable uh, consumer protection agency. It's backed by a whole heck of a lot. Uh, if we have innovations, let's bring it into the backed system. Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, Another question, and the theme of, of collaboration is certainly here. Um, and Judith, this one's for you. Um, how do you or are you working with provincial consumer agencies? And, you know, do you monitor federally regulated financial entities for compliance with provincial uh, regulations? Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, I love the question because uh, while we're all on the federal panel, uh, we uh, we know that there's uh, plenty that goes on outside of our strict uh, jurisdictional world. Uh, so the quick answer is no. Of course, we have no um, uh, legislative authority for monitoring uh, uh, compliance with provincial provincial regulations. But the slightly longer answer is that, of course, we have a real interest uh, and a aligned interest with the provincial regulators, both on the security side and on the consumer protection side, uh, to uh, share uh, information and expertise uh, and uh, where uh, we can uh, support and enhance each other's activities. So uh, actually embedded in the FCAC's mandate is an object to uh, you know, promote collaboration and coordination with other uh, uh, regulators, and uh, we uh, actively seek opportunities to do that. Great. And from your perspective, uh, Leah, I see a theme here around uh, broadening access, uh, broadening membership. Um, you know, obviously, CDIC insures uh, deposits in specified federally regulated institutions, is there any thought to expanding uh, membership out to entities that uh, take deposits on behalf of others or fintechs or paytechs that may be uh, looking to enter the, the ecosystem? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, it's a great question. And as I mentioned earlier, we are working hand in glove with uh, our agency colleagues, uh, colleagues, including the superintendent. Uh, on this. And I would say that, you know, I, I think step one is really deciding what is the appropriate perimeter of regulation to promote stability in the core financial system. Um, and there are different ways to do that. But if, if the activities of an institution are such that they're, they are systemic and can transmit um, risk to other parts of the system, um, as Peter was mentioning, there is a case for uh, establishing a perimeter that brings them in such that they are appropriately prudentially regulated. And with that, that's the, the beauty of the safety net that deposit insurance provides is it provides greater consumer confidence and trust in that institution or that entity uh, that uh, the money held there will be safe, which promotes financial stability by uh, avoiding, have, providing that, that, that assurance to consumers to not uh, need to run in the event of uh, any um, uh, event in the, the system that, that creates uh, potential panic, uh, it provides peace of mind. So definitely a role for, for deposit insurance, but it, you know, it is part of the bigger discussion on the appropriate perimeter. Uh, and, and Ron, I'm just looking at the, the questions coming in and, and no doubt a lot of interest in the, in the developments on the framework. Um, you, know, you, you mentioned over 2000 uh, potential entities Within the, the the realm of of, of the new framework, um, and so it's a it's a wide variety of of constituents that you have there. What are you learning from the consultations in, that's helping you shape particular aspects that maybe you didn't think of going into uh, the establishment here? Uh, great question, Mike. Uh, so we've had uh, we created a, an advisory council of uh, payment service providers who's helped us along the way. Uh, we, uh, we talked with them uh, the, in advance of the uh, 
legislation uh, being tabled, their comments help shape that. Their comments are equally helping to shape uh, the regulations that uh, we're, uh, where we're advising the Department of Finance as those regulations get built out. Uh, so uh, there have been numerous examples in terms of how uh, operational risk gets uh, managed or you know, setting standards for uh, recovery time for uh, for pay payment service providers where we've gotten really good feedback and uh, we're gonna be reflecting that in the, uh, um, uh, looking to reflect that in the regulations uh, themselves. So it's been uh, very collaborative uh, thus far. The It's also been a chance to for us to, to help understand that the regulations we're creating can work for both the you know the multi-billion dollar uh, uh, payment service company that operates in a hundred different countries, or the two-person fintech startup that uh, was created to send payments to a handful of countries in in Africa. The the this the framework has to work for both, and it it's going to be risk-based and proportionate so that uh, so that it does. And the feedback we've gotten has really helped uh, advance our thinking in in terms of how best to do that. Great. I think tremendous interest as, as, as the, the situation unfolds and you're giving shape to it. Um, I think one of the benefits of, of attending these types of panels virtually is people get to uh, read on some of the things that we've uh, mentioned in terms of newsletters and recent announcements. And I see someone has picked up uh, OSFI's annual risk outlook, Peter, um, and they're asking the question around um, there's several interrelated risks. You mentioned seven risks in the report. Um, but the potential that all of these happen in tandem, how does OSFI think about the complexities um, of you know, a very fluid risk environment where cyber risk, digital risks, climate risks are colliding? It, um, uh, I mean, there, there's, a, there's two answers. One is um, that's, the interrelated nature of those risks are just something we have to accept and uh, deal with. Um, and there's not much we can do about it. The, uh, so that's kind of the passive answer. The active answer is uh, we have to do more faster now with greater urgency. Uh, we have to get our federal uh, regulatory framework uh, updated and, uh, and upgraded to deal with these risks. We have to move forward as quickly as the, we can on climate. We have to move forward as quickly as we can on regulatory perimeter. We have to keep our eye on the housing ball. We have to do more faster now. Uh, that's the active response. And that's sort of what our blueprint is about. No, absolutely. Um, uh, the next question, I really, really like this one, Judith. And I, 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 I we talk a lot about digital. We talk a lot about the future in digital. Is there risk of going too fast and leaving Canadians behind? There are certain parts of our population that may not have access to digital tools or may not want to use digital financial services. Um, how do we ensure that you know, our protections and our thoughts are inclusive to a broad, broad audience of Canadians? Yeah, I really like that question too. Thank you. And I know on the agenda today, there was at least one, if not more than one, uh, panels on uh, financial inclusion uh, in the digital context. And I think this is really important work uh, that we will need to do uh, jointly uh, as regulators, policymakers, and as industry. Because of course, uh, uh, coincidence with uh, the fact that, you know, digital application, as Peter was saying earlier, uh, uh, offers great convenience and benefits to a very large uh, uh, segment of the population. There are also segments of the populations for, for whom that is not true. Uh, and uh, we can't in our enthusiasm uh, for uh, the advantages for uh, even the majority, uh, forget that financial inclusion is a key component to uh, overall um, uh, wellness and uh, uh, societal strength. Uh, we benefit greatly from having a, a very high level of financial inclusion currently, and it would be um, important for us to ensure uh, that, that we figure out how to do that. You know, one example in our world is there are requirements uh, for uh, what's called basic banking. Uh, in the Bank Act, so anyone can take a government check to a bank branch and get it get it cashed. 
anyone has the right to open a bank account at any uh, branch in Canada with the proper identification. So how do we translate those uh, access to banking services uh, as a foundational requirement for participation in our economy? Uh, how do we translate that into uh, an effective digital uh, requirement? And that's gonna take a lot of uh, uh, thoughtful application uh, and, uh, and real innovation, I would say. So there's some, some great opportunities there, but it needs to be uh, carefully uh, and thoughtfully done and won't happen by accident. Thanks, Judith. I think that's a great note to leave the session on, which is uh, let's make sure the financial system we want is one that is works for all Canadians. Um, and I think I'd speak on behalf of the panel uh, and echo that point. And it's, uh, it's an opportunity for all of us as we're thinking about the innovations to come. Um, uh, look, uh, in closing the panel, I just want to thank the panelists, of course, and thank Payments Canada for the opportunity to talk on these topics. We wish you a good afternoon and uh, obviously see you in person next time. Um, enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you very much. Thanks, all. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike.